I am always excited when I have a guest, but today I am very excited because I have my friend Steve and also a past client. And to give you a little bit of a background of how we met, it was during COVID, during that time where we were kind of isolated and we had a group of people and you came with one person that Alicia invited and he just became part of the group. We connected over tequila, talking about traveling to Mexico. He also really does love dressing up in style. So when he hired me, it was actually more of how do I learn how to dress down a little bit? Because when I go to casual settings, I feel like I'm always dressed or I just wear a hoodie. So we had fun exploring that topic, which we might talk about later because he really does enjoy good style. Today's conversation is an important one. If you didn't listen to one of the last episodes I did about what it was like to not drink for 30 days, this is kind of a continuation to have a conversation and outside perspective with somebody going through something similar. So it is a conversation that is really popular for this year. A lot of people are finding that they're having more awareness around what they want and sometimes alcohol is affecting some of the things they want or how they wanna feel. And I wanna give a perspective on women and men and different situations. So we're going to go all into it today. If you guys wanna hear more, we can always do another episode. But I want to thank you, Steve, for spending some time with me today again. We got to hang out a little bit yesterday, too. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. And I kind of want to start. So we are also going to talk about the perspective of men and women and what it's like to be a modern man. And if you are listening to this and you are a woman, I want you to stay on because these are topics for the men in our life, too, whether they're your brother, your dad, or a significant other. I think that being able to talk about certain things is really important in today's podcast. We're gonna dive into that. So the reason why we actually reconnected is I was just scrolling through Facebook. I haven't seen you post too much lately, but I saw a post that really caught my eye because it said that you wanted to stop drinking and you wanted to drink less and you were kind of on this journey and you were asking people like for support. And because I had went through it, I was like, oh my gosh, I really want to talk to him and hear him about like what's going on. So can you share what happened that caused it? Was it like an event, a series of things that happened? Yeah, it, it definitely is a series of things that that happened in my life. Um, you know, I'll try to keep it somewhat short, but 2023, I think was challenging for a lot of people. For me, there were several things. Uh, the, the company that I landed kind of my dream job with, they were struggling. And so I ended up uh, quitting to save some other people's jobs, um, having some pretty significant uh, health issues within my family. My dad and my uncle are having some struggles. And I just, I kind of had this buildup of, of stress that normally I'm able to, to kind of power through. Um, and meanwhile, I started kind of like a long distance relationship, which brings all of its own emotional challenges and a little bit of anxiety. And what I what I started to notice is the day after I would drink, my anxiety was like a nine. And my coping skills just weren't working. And it was just, you know, I've spent so many days just kind of like spinning down that that drain of doom. And I'm I can do something about this. And so I just decided, you know, I'm going to go 90 days. I'm going to make it public so that I have accountability. And that's kind of how you found my post was I just decided, you know what, I, I, I don't, I don't need people to go along the journey with me, but, but I don't, I didn't, couldn't think of a better way to keep accountability. Right. And, and I think having accountability partners and what I found was all my friends on Facebook were immediately so supportive. I was actually really touched. It was blown away by how many people are like, Hey, we're going through the same thing and we got you. And, you know, if it's the middle of the night, call me or whatever else. So that was, that was pretty beautiful. But yeah, so that, that's kind of how I got started. And I think that's the best way of doing things. I find not just with drinking, but I found in the past when people go on a weight loss journey and they really want to change their eating habits or exercising, they're posting and making sure that, you know, when you share it publicly, it almost makes you feel like you have to go through with it. It's kind of like having a therapist, like you go through a session and you're like, oh, I didn't do what I said I was gonna do. I actually did that with my book. I started it two years ago and I, 
I started, I think I did like one and a half chapters and that's it. And I didn't follow through. And this time I started in September and I publicly told it to everybody. I mentioned it a few times and kind of shared my journey and it made me feel like, okay, I put it out there. This is a big goal I wanted to do and it kind of kept me going. So I'm almost done with my first round of edits, but yeah, doing that accountability thing and telling everybody makes a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, good and good for you, by the way. Congratulations. That's 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 quite an achievement. You know, I I personally am a big believer in in manifestation. And I think putting that out there also just kind of brings you the energy you need, whether that's healing energy or whether that's, you know, the the constitution to keep going or whatever it might be. So um yeah, it, and it's you know, I like I messed up the day before New Year's, right? I had I found myself drinking and and the next day I, I posted it and people were so supportive. And, and I just thought to myself, you know what? I'm kind of a perfectionist anyway. So just kind of admitting those flaws, it makes it less stressful, right? Because otherwise I'm really OCD and, and I'm constantly, you know, writing down in my journals or thinking about certain things. And that doesn't help with the, the underlying anxiety where I just, I mean, my goal for 2024, like I have a theme and it's to be present. Like, I just want to learn how to be present in every moment. And that's one of the things that I realized with drinking is you, you're not, right? I mean, how many days have we woken up like, what did I do last night? You know? And, and so um, I have 14-year-old boys and I want to learn to be present with every moment because I don't know how many, you know, more days that I get to go hang out with them, right? And mm -hmm. so you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of driving this for sure. And even going back to that part of perfection, because I have that too, when things don't go the way that you want to with your goal, and it happens with anything in life, regardless if it's your personal style and your shopping habits, to drinking, to eating, there are moments we are human. We are not meant to be linear and go one way. There are times where we are going to have a setback, but knowing how to have that courage to get back on the train and keep going is really important. And I'm glad that you were able to like tell people that because it also makes you more real and more human saying, you know, I'm going through the experience. I had a slip up, but I'm back on board. And now how do I focus on today and tomorrow? So that's a big one. Yeah. And, and you know, like when I posted, there were so many other people that have, have gone through a similar journey and, and they were sharing their experience. And, and I hope also by showing, you know, that sort of fallibility and the willingness to, to be vulnerable about it and then get back on the horse, if that encourages anybody else who's reading my stuff to jump in, I, I definitely want to pay it forward. Like, I'm going to get through 90 days of not drinking. I'm going to get to the point where, you know, like we talked about one or two and then be able to cut it off or never drink again. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I'm going to get to that point. And if, if my journey and my struggles and then my success is, is encouraging to anybody else, then I feel like I'm paying it forward. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of selfish and it's kind of selfless at the same time. You know, I think that a lot of people, and I might just be saying this without knowing because I haven't taken a poll, I'm just assuming. I feel like a lot of people might be struggling with this, but it's not something that is talking, you know, people don't talk about it openly because what do you see in movies? What do you see on social media? What do you see, you know, people doing? Everything is revolved around drinking. It is the dinner party, any celebration, birthdays, you know, New Year's, whatever it is, having family gatherings, going out for happy hour with a friend in the middle of the day. It's so interesting how a lot of our life is really revolved around it. But once we have that awareness of, you know, whether it's our anxiety or decisions we made while we were drinking that just don't feel that good. People aren't talking about that though. They're just talking about the fun that they had showing the pictures before him with the margarita, you know, in the picture <laughs> and everything as big as their face. I think that being able to share this will bring other people in the conversation. And that's why I was so glad when you did talk about it. And like you said, I didn't have that big outpour like you did. I'm so glad that a lot of people came to you and they were like, oh yeah, I'm going through this too. I'm sure at the podcast episode, people are going to be sharing that more, but that's, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that other people opened up to you with that. Yeah, it was quite something. I actually received a couple of phone calls too, and, and, and had some really great conversation with folks. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you, you, you share with your network that you're going to stop drinking and, and it's like publicly, everybody's very supportive. It's really interesting when you get into a more private situation 
And like, people kind of like, they're like, why aren't you drinking? Like, come on. You know, there's, there's pressure to do a certain thing. And, and so just kind of having that backup, like I know I could call you or I could, you know, call some other people and be like, Hey, I'm about to go to a, a function with people. Uh, you know, can you, can, can you be on call in case I decide I want to do something right. And people are, they're willing to do it. But when you're the people you're around, it's kind of like, it's kind of the opposite. They want to pressure you into doing the thing that you don't want to do. And, and I, I'm thinking that, you know, you and I kind of talked about this yesterday. Like I'm, I'm curious how long it takes where people get used to the fact that you just don't do this anymore. And they just kind of let you alone. I'm curious to see how long that takes. And that actually goes into my next question, because I think people are going to be entertained about hearing more about what it's like to go out with people that are all drinking and you get to sit there and watch. <laughs> so would you like to share an experience? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, when you're the sober one, it's really interesting watching people in the process of, of you know, getting their buzz and then being drunk. I mean, I, I literally just went to the Husky game. Was it the day yesterday or the day before, whatever day it was. And it, it was like five minutes into the first quarter and people, you know, they were scoring and people were doing their shots. And, <laughs> and I hate to say it, but people get dumb when they're drunk and it feels like you have to bait when you're the sober one, you kind of feel like a babysitter, right? Because then the drama picks up and then, you know, the couple start chirping at each other and it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, do I have to sit through this? <laughs> it is it's, it is funny though. It is entertaining, but at the same time, you're like, what the fuck? You're like, yeah. Sitting here and I know you because you're the more present, observant one when you're not drinking, you you aren't in the emotions and everything happening. So you're listening to the conversations, you're seeing them fall over, you're seeing them take more drinks when they're obviously, you know, blasted with alcohol at them. And you just sit there and wonder like, what, what is going on around me? And how was I before when I was doing this? Yeah, it's, it is kind of eye opening. Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was doing all of those oh, things, yeah. right? You know, the thing where you drink too much, and you're kind of like, can't stand up straight, or, you know, and, and, and I think I think about, at least in terms of relationship, like, what percentage of the arguments we got into were started because our inability to to you know come together and have a constructive conversation because of booze, right? And it's it's a non-trivial percentage, like well over half. I, I know I haven't like really like studied it or something like that, but you know it's not a small percentage of ridiculous arguments started because of drinking. And I'm just like, is that? Is, that, is it really as fun as we make it out to be? I, I'm curious if that's true, you know? And 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 you and I kind of talked about this yesterday. I know people that just don't drink and they go out and they have a great time exactly. and they're present and they remember it and they feel good the next day and they're productive the next day, right? And so I, I'm i not sure at what point we kind of lose that perspective, like, yeah, I kind of feel like crap the next day. And I don't really remember everything that happened the night before. And was it really that much fun? I, mm -hmm. I that's kind of a, you know, I, I, I wish I was more capable of, of journaling when I was drunk. <laughs> okay. Just so I could go read my experience. Oh, the experience I used to, after I got divorced, I drank a lot and I did journal and the emotions were high. I actually threw away one of the journals I had because I, I didn't have children at the time, but I was like, if my kids read this, I don't want them to know all the stuff that went through my head and how emotional I got because of the drinking, because outside of the drinking, yes, you still feel the same feelings, but they're not on that high and as exaggerated as you make it seem. Yeah, so. yeah. well, I, I, that's something that I definitely noticed with the anxiety, which is, you know, my coping skills, my ability to process, my ab ability to sit with that discomfort is so much better when I'm sober, mm -hmm. right? That the alcohol just makes it worse, you know? Uh, and, and I have to imagine that's not a lot of fun to be around. I'm curious with you, because I have kind of a new set goal, which I didn't share yesterday, but I'll share today. But I'm curious with you, what, what do you hope to gain from the three months that you want to go without drinking, what do you hope to gain from the experience? I mean, there, for me, the primary goal was, I just need to be on top of this anxiety that I, I'm not somebody who's had chronic anxiety in my life. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I can say unequivocally that it, it was triggered by the long distance relationship that I started. And then the alcohol just made it worse. Right. And so, you know, I don't want to live in that space. I, and there were times where it was so bad. I would be sitting in my living room, my children would be talking to me and I didn't even hear them. Yeah. Right. And that just made, it made me sad. I would, I was like, these are moments I need to be present. This is, this is my why for the last 15 years has mm -hmm. been raising children, you know? And, and I think that's also part of the anxiety is my why starts to change as my kids start to become more independent. So, you know, th these are things that, that we have to process and the alcohol, it just, it impedes your growth. Right. And, and I'm kind of on this, this EQ journey, this growth journey. I, I would love to find a relationship again. And I want to be healthy inside of that space. And what I'm finding is, is, is the alcohol is just, it impedes all of that. And so like, what do I, I just want to be healthier all the way around. I want a better emotional health. I want to be more present. Like I said, my goal for 24 is, is to learn to, to be always be present. I don't want to be on my phone all the time. I don't want those crutches. And, and I think, I think I want to just learn to have fun without it too. You know, I want to be able to go boating or skiing or, you know, any of those things that we do with our friends and I want to remember. Them. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's really, it really is an emotional thing for me. Yeah. Mine actually is too. Um, I think I talk about in the other podcast episode that month I stopped drinking. I, I feel like I am pretty good. I'd say pretty good, not completely good being present as a mom. Um, and when I wasn't drinking, there were moments where I really could just like sit and just look at my daughter's face and admire her and hear her and just like be there. Cause at nighttime is when mine is a little bit different. I don't socially drink as much for some reason, it's easier for me to stop. But when I'm at home in mom mode with my bottle of wine open and the extra one in the back, cause we have a wine membership, <laughs> like it's so easy to just like start and just keep going. So, I found that being more present as a mom was really important. I also feel like because uh, with my time, it's just so limited with my work time, everything I want to do with my routine, the days that I do drink, it's like the day starts a little bit later. I'm a little bit slower. And even though it doesn't happen often, it's interesting that the days that it does happen, I actually get really upset with myself instead of being like, oh, let me just be happy that I had so much fun last night or enjoyed my time. And I actually get upset with myself and I'm like, that's called self-sabotage. If I'm doing something yes. and I'm mad, I am self-sabotaging whatever I want and it's something different. So trying to be more clear on those things I want, I think has to do with not drinking as much. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, right? Like I, I have a, a pretty rigid morning routine that I go through. And it's funny, if I've drank too much, all of a sudden, you know, I'm not up in the morning, I'm not doing my cold plunge, I'm not, you know, doing my breathing exercises, right? Like exercise, it kind of gets pushed down the road. And, and yeah, it just, it, it has the sort of like compound and cascading effect um, on productivity, how you feel about yourself. And that, and I think that probably drives, you know, you're talking about like sort of being upset, that probably drives those whatever emotion is, whether it's anxiety or anger or disappointment or whatever it is, I, it definitely uh, is a compounding effect along with the fact that you're you know, processing this poison and it's, it has all its depressive factors yeah, that come with that as well, sure. you know? Yeah. And, and, and it's so funny because now there's things out there like take this pill, take this supplement, do this. And everybody has their like post drinking routines to try to recover. And I'm like, just skip it. <laughs> Just skip it. <laughs> your body literally does not want it in your system and it has to come out. Like, I, I don't know. I'm just, I personally am not somebody that likes to take a lot of medicine. Even if my head hurts, I'm like, let me try to hold off. Let me see how much I can handle. And then I just take it when I can't. But I'm like, if your body doesn't want it, why are you going to give it some kind of medication to process the alcohol? I actually have never tried it. I don't know if you have, but I have never tried all of them, but they show up on my feed all the time yep it, it's crazy that the alcohol because you know all of these remedies are created by the alcohol industry right yeah oh and yeah like, oh you won't feel bad we'll take care of that for you so you can drink <laughs> i do want to switch gears because you mentioned it about your boys i 
I love how life kind of does, life is just an interesting thing. Having children really changes your perspective on things about yourself, what you want to change for yourself, what you wish you could do differently for your own life when you're a child. How does drinking tie into this perspective that you want of teaching them to be a modern man and what that means? Ooh, well, that that is that is a really dynamic question. So, yeah. you know, um, my boys are 14, so just everybody knows that, you know, they're what age we're talking about here. And that they are aware of my behavior, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I, I'm I'm a parent that I don't make a lot of things taboo. Like, that's how I was raised, and, and I didn't get into a lot of trouble. So I feel like that method kind of works. So if I'm drinking a tequila or I'm drinking a bourbon and my son is like, what's that taste like? I'll let him have a taste of it, mm -hmm. right? The other flip side of that, all of a sudden, he's like, ooh, I like this, yeah. right? And his dad, I'm like, uh-oh, what am I creating here, right? So six years ago, I got divorced, a little over six years ago. And I kind of went on this whole, like, EQ journey, going to therapy and, and reading my books and, 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 and trying to heal and trying to grow and all these sort of things. And it really made me realize that when I was young, these weren't things that were highly valued. They weren't skills that our parents were going to instill into us, right? When I was little, it's like, you know, if you broke your arm or skinned your knee, it was like, boys don't cry, right? Like suck it up to be tough. And, and, and when you were tough, you were praised. Oh yeah, you did such a good job of toughing that out, right? What I realized is that, you know, as we build our traumas over time, it gets harder and harder to remember and to process and, and to take these subconscious wounds and bring them into our conscience. And so I'm trying to highlight these things with, with my sons. Right. And, and so I, we have a, a set of virtues that, that I try to instill to them. There's three of them. I'm not going to share because it's kind of a, a private family thing, but if I'm drunk around my sons or if I come home at two o'clock in the morning, hammered, and they're here and then they wake up in the morning and they kind of see me kind of in that zombie state. What am I teaching them? Am I, am I teaching them to, to be present? Am I teaching them to live and sit with their feelings or am I teaching them, Hey, go out and party and pretend like all this stuff isn't, isn't real. I know plenty of, of dads and who are good men and providers and all these sort of things that they drink to excess in front of their children and i watch this and i go no i, I can't be that guy especially now where they're going to start to get curious about the whole concept of modern man like i think we should probably break this up a little bit because i can probably talk for the whole rest of the time yes i think that we could break it up starting with i like how you mentioned yesterday that and i think this is important for anything in life is that you get to define it and you get to break the rules of what you learned so I think in your case, are there any roles that you have decided now as a fully adult man has lived his life and you're kind of like questioning maybe the past year or so of like, you know, maybe there's this or that, maybe one or two things that you're like, maybe that's not who I want to integrate into like the man I am now or what I want to teach my children that a man should be, should. Yeah, could that... <laughs> That whole what what is a real man? What is the like? What is the definition of a modern man, right? And 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 we know that's changing. I guess the the, the thing that I I want to instill is that figure out how to be just a hundred percent comfortable with the authentic you, mm -hmm. right? And so if if culture and society don't necessarily align with that, you don't be a jerk, but be okay, right? Mm -hmm. Be calm, be centered. Like that, that whole core confidence thing, nobody really ever taught me what that means or how to do that. And, and I think that really comes from just, I'm okay with how I feel. I'm okay with how I look. I'm okay with how I interact with people. And I'm okay with the fact that there's 8 billion people on this planet and they're not all going to like me, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that is one of the things that, that I kind of start with. And so, you know, like like we were talking about yesterday, our children are coming up in a time where access to information and access to their personal lives is so public because of social media, because of cell phones, because of gossip around school, that they are dealing, they're inundated with this stuff at all times. So if, if 
if we as parents aren't instilling these skills in them to be just cool who they are, there's a lot of suffering. You know, the, the kids suffering because of bullying, because of, of criticism, because they're not as dressed the same way. Some, I mean, you know, especially where we live, where people have a lot of means. Right. And so they're, they're constantly flooded with this sort of thing. And so one of the things that I don't want my kids to take on is that that ego. Right. And so I talk to them all the time about who you are versus who your ego is. Right. And, and my lesson to them is your ego's job is to protect you. Right. And it learns everything it know it's ever going to need to know by the time it's seven years old. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we hear this term man child and I talk to my kids about this. Right. That's your ego taking control of you. And so like one of the things that I don't want them to do is to get wrapped up like in their sports. I don't let them talk smack. I teach them that if you're running your mouth, you're not spending enough time concentrating on what you're supposed to be doing, right? Um, I, I teach them sort of sort of like the quiet confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Be that person that walks in the room and listens. And then when you say some things, people pay attention because you, you're not constantly flapping your gums. Yeah. And, and I, it, it's, it's interesting because when we talk about what's it mean to be the modern man, I, I, think that, I think that definition is kind of, it's totally malleable in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I tell my sons is that, look, nobody gets to tell you what a real man is, right? You get to tell you what a real man is. And, and no offense, ladies, as, as, a, as a heterosexual guy, I, I'm not listening to the chaff that's on Instagram and on Facebook about the definition of a real man, mm -hmm. right? Because, and it's the same for, for, for women. If you don't sit in our shoes, you can't possibly know what that feels like. You know, I, I mentioned this in a post that I wrote. It's like the expectations for us to, to, especially people my age, to learn how to be emotionally available, to be emotionally intelligent, to learn what vulnerability, vulnerability means, right? To be able to express the way you feel, to cry, right? Like I cry now and I don't care if anybody doesn't like it I, because I've learned to feel things. I don't compartmentalize. Like, can I, am I good at compartmentalizing feelings? Of course. Like if there's a stressful situation, I can push all that stuff aside and, and, and operate. But what I've learned is those things are valuable. They help you grow. They help you become more mature. They keep, help you become more empathic, right? And so it's really important to me that I take all this stuff that I'm learning now and instill that mm -hmm. into my kids at a younger age so that they have these skills and they're not building it on, you know, 40 years of traumas, right? And that they can start and, and exist in this world. So, yeah, I, the expectations on what it means to be a modern man, they're, they're kind of hard to keep up with. Like, feel things, but don't feel them too much. Like, learn to, to sit inside your feelings, but don't let it affect you too much, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, constantly, we're supposed to be these beings that are providers and protectors, and we're supposed to feel things, and we're supposed to be able to deal with all that and be cool, calm, confident, and collected at the same time. And, like, listen, honest, it's too much. It's too much. Like, ladies, if you want a guy who feels things, you're going to have to deal with the fact that he feels things, and he's going to talk about feelings. And if, if you're going to browbeat him, like, oh, my gosh, my guy's so sensitive, like, you're going to turn him off, right? And, and so... I guess one of the things that I also teach my sons is, is you do you. And if people don't like it, you keep doing you. It takes guts, right? We, you and I kind of talked about this yesterday. I know I have friends who are, who are divorced and single and about my age, and they are terrified to walk up to a woman at a bar or at the gym or other places where they, you know, have their hobbies because they're worried about ending up on TikTok. Say the wrong thing. <laughs> Getting in trouble. And it and it's like it's like you want a guy. I I know that in the single world you want someone who's confident enough to come up to talk to you. Yes. But you can't. Pardon my French, but you can't be an asshole about it. You just can't. You know, because what you're going to do is you're going to get three percent of the guys who just don't care, and those are going to be the men who come up and talk to you. And a lot of time you're not going to like those guys because most of the time they aren't emotionally invested, right? So they're fun for a few minutes, but they're not fun for life. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I do work with, um, I work in the dating scene a lot with people that are dating again, especially men. 
and there's different coaches and everybody has their own method and even searching through social media um, because I do connect with dating coaches a lot. I just have this pet peeve because for myself, when I work with people, even with their personal style, it's never telling you who to be or to create a persona in your life. And what some people do to an extreme to date and be a man is they completely try to change who they are and then they date and obviously the real them comes out and then it doesn't work out. Like, I'm not sure if you know, but some people actually rent pets to take in pictures to show they have a pet or rent friends or a car and create something that is just fake and they're not Great being story. who they truly are. And some dating coaches also give advice on how a man should, and these are actually sometimes women. There are men too, but I feel like the women dating coaches kind of share more of like how a man should act. They all need a scarf or what they need to say on the first date. And it's like, yeah, I am just, I'm just against people sharing in general, whether it's style, dating, <laughs> who you are as a person, what you need to do to be liked. It's like, you need to, it's just more like being aware of yourself, working on yourself. None of us are perfect. We all find these things like, oh, you know what? This season, I need to work on this because I realized I'm having trouble in this area of my life. But yeah, changing who you are to please somebody and shape shift is not the right way. It ends up coming out anyways if you try doing it. Like you will burst later on because you held so much inside. Yeah, it. it I think culturally, I, I, I do understand what you're saying. Like there's, People have figured out how to create a story to make themselves initially more attractive. And, and I think, I really do think that online dating has really driven a lot of this, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it is sadly a statistical fact that, you know, 10% is amongst men, 10% among uh, of men get most of the dates, mm -hmm. right? And that's, and that's because with a dating profile, you need to have certain kinds of pictures. You need to look like you're interesting and that you, you have personality and you know how to smile and that you have confidence. Well, especially where we live, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm in the IT world, right? And a lot of the guys that I work with, they're not, they're introverts, right? They're not these sort of like outwardly expressive. They're not, you know, they're not like me where they enjoy going and, and finding an outfit that looks awesome for themselves. Right. And so, to get the attention, they learn I have to create this story, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I don't know how we change that, but what I just tell them is, look, man, be you. And if you only get two dates, those dates are going to be a lot more meaningful because those women actually want to be there with you, with mm -hmm. you, not the story of you. Yeah. And that's 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 hard. That's really hard to accept, right? Like in terms of in terms of our ego, in terms of what you know, we at least at my age, what we we're taught is masculine it, that's kind of damaging to realize that you know what there may only be a small percentage of the populace that's interested in me mm -hmm. i don't i don't exactly know how to deal with all that but what i what i tell like i i mentor a group of younger guys in their late 20s and to mid 30s and i you know they 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 message me like how do how do i respond to this message on on tinder and i i just uh, almost every time i tell them i'm like what do you feel because mm -hmm. right? if because if you answer like me when you get on the date she's going to be like who is this person it's so interesting too like you talk about masculine and we talked well we didn't talk about feminine but masculine and feminine qualities and especially for our age group of what we grew up seeing like what it's supposed to be like what we are taught it's supposed to be like and for a long time in my earlier years i dated very 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 masculine men but to the point where they didn't support me in the place that I wanted to be, because yes, I have my feminine qualities, but I do have a lot of masculine in me since I was young. I've always, I started my business when I was like 22. Um, and I started my business plan when I was 21. And I always had it in me, like I was just driven. Even through college, I got married when I was 18 and I still went to college, still did the thing. I didn't give up my dreams and my life for somebody. and. My problem was I was just with like very masculine men that just didn't budge. They could not accept a feminine woman that was both feminine and had that masculine quality in her. And so it's interesting as we're growing and culture is changing, 
how we get to define who we are and being more accepting of it. And I've had to, we talked about yesterday when I started dating again, when I was a single mom, especially as a single mom, my baby was like a year and a few months. And I was like, I have like two days a week, if that, to go on a date with somebody. Like I have to be upfront because my time is like precious. I do not have a lot of time to go out. So within the first couple of days, if we had like two or three dates, I'd just be very open. Like, this is my life. I like to work. I have my own business and I have a child and I like to, you know, do all the feminine stuff. But there is a side of me that I might at night take out my laptop. It's a bad, it is a bad habit. I have stopped it for the most part, but I will sit next to you and my laptop will be out and I will have a movie there and I won't actually watch it. But I was just very honest with who I was because I didn't want to surprise somebody and then be offended like, oh, she doesn't do this. Oh, she doesn't do that. She doesn't make my lunch for me, like whatever it was. She won't do my laundry. No, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> and you know what? Good, good for you, right? And, and and that is kind of the evolution of things, right? I'm very attracted to someone who is driven and motivated and growth oriented, right? Mm -hmm. Because who I want to be with is someone that I can build something with. I don't care if it's a business, a hot rod, a travel agency. I don't care what it is, but I want yeah. something that we, that we build, uh -huh. right? And, and so, like, that is attractive to me. But I also, like, when we're home, like you just mentioned, and, and we're in private time or we're on vacation or, or something like that, I do enjoy being in my masculine energy and being with a woman who is comfortable and feels safe stepping mm -hmm. into her feminine, right? And so I, I think something for you know, men to learn how to do is, and, and have it as their sort of objective is to provide a safe place for that. It needs to be a physically and emotionally safe place for someone such as yourself to sort of shed the, the masculine energy that is required to be the owner of a business or be in the C-suite of, of a business as a woman. Like we know that there's like breaking through that glass ceiling requires you to sacrifice certain parts of femininity, right? Like it's my job as a partner, as a man to provide that safe place. And I don't think a lot of guys even think about that. Like they though I'm a protector. Like if somebody breaks in the house, like that's not what it means to be a protector. At least I don't think so. But yeah. I, I think, I think, I think the emotional security and safety is the, a, a much more dynamic and more difficult challenge for someone to take. Right. And, and part of that, like you said, for these guys that couldn't accept that you, you love to work is to be able to separate you from her and be like, she loves this. What can I do to uplift this? Because mm -hmm. then when she gets home, she's happy. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and that is, that is a shift from our parents' generation, right? Where usually only one person worked. Usually it was the man, right? He was gone all day. And when he got home, it was like, oh, you know, all the traditional stuff that we learned as, as kids, that's not culture anymore. It's mm -hmm. just not. You know, and, and sure, I'm sure that there are couples out there that are still like that. But I think I think generally speaking, if a guy is looking for that, especially in the United States, especially on the coast of the United States, he's going to be a very frustrated human. <laughs> yes, agreed completely. And even circling back as we're ending this conversation about stepping into who you are, whether you're in your feminine energy, your masculine energy, how you want to define who you want to be as a man or a woman, it does actually tie back in a little bit to the drinking part, especially for you or somebody that's single or trying to change their life and do different things. For me, it's stepping into this next level with my career this year. Having that space to do it means letting go of something and one of it for both of us is on that same page it's drinking to attract the experiences that we want these new people we want in our life or bring other people back from our life that maybe we we neglected because we were so lost in something else that drinking part could be playing something into whatever is coming in for this year which i think is absolutely. awesome <laughs> absolutely a a absolutely yeah i mean you know it, having that having that healthy vibration that healthy energy and putting that out there um, and, and being someone that other people want to be around, right? Like, we, you know, whether you're building your career and you're trying to attract, you know, the, the, the mentors in your life, or, you know, you're trying to build your network out and, or that sort of thing, like you, your healthy energy impacts who you attract. I totally believe that is true.
I encourage everybody to give it a try and see how it affects them. Right. Like I'm, I mean, just truth be told, I'm what, uh, so 25 days in, mm -hmm. uh, I've had one slip up and, and I notice it. I, I notice my presence is more. I notice my, my discipline is better. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and at some point that's going to lead to different relationships, different experiences than I would have had if I was out drinking the way I was. Exactly. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we close up? I just want to say thank you. I love this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm always having this conversation with with my sons and with with younger men who are sort of coming up in this world. Um, and and I think it's important that we share both pers both perspectives. Um, and if you have a podcast for the ladies, that is the sort of the the antithesis to this conversation, I can't, I would love to either join or listen in. And I would certainly share this with, with my group of people, because we, I feel like we're so busy today with all of the sort of objectives and, and societal pressures that are on us that we forget to just sit and listen every now and again. Mm -hmm. Right. And that whole like being present thing, like just, just give people a shot. Don't be so judgmental. Right. Um, because it's not easy for anybody. It's not easy for anybody. No, we didn't even dive in, but both of us, everybody even listening, all of us have a whole background of stories of family and trauma and everything that affect the beautiful person that you are today and everything that you have gone through really creates who you are. But there's so much stuff from our past, you know, and being able to just like talk through things and being human with somebody and getting to hear real perspectives and not having a wall up creates connection with people instantly. So it's it's something that I think, like you said, people just need to do. Like listen to people, don't judge them. We all have things that we're struggling with or going through. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I guess the last thought that I'll leave with this is this: this is a big thing that I noticed actually this on on new, this New Year's gathering that I went to, which is which is this is that. As hard as our lives might be and, and whatever traumas that we have, I think people have this sort of like intrinsic need to think that their stuff is harder or worse than other people's. And it's just not. Yeah. Everybody is going, even the most successful, happiest looking people, you know, are have traumas and emotional issues and struggles that they're going through that are just as hard just different than yours and if you can keep that perspective and remember that about people boy oh boy your empathy sure goes up to the moon and you'll be surprised about how many more friends you meet just by being considerate of that that is so beautiful oh i could talk with you forever like literally i could just keep talking <laughs> I want to thank you so much for hanging out today. And if you are listening to this podcast and this is a conversation that you want to have with somebody close in your life, share it. That is the best way to start a conversation. I always talk about it, but when I am with a friend or my sister or even with Michael or anybody and I'm listening to a podcast, if it's a conversation that feels weird to just bring up, you could just say, hey, I heard this conversation. Do you want to hear about it? Because I think we could talk about it together. It's podcasts are a great way of just starting new conversations with people. So feel free to share this with somebody you love if you want to start talking about drinking or about showing up more authentically with who you are. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya.